Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and regret the fact that I missed your opening statements as I have, have another committee with hearings going on at the same time. It's one of the cruel tricks that the Senate plays on a person, uh, multiple hearing obligations at, at, at the same time, but I'm very glad to be with you here today. My staff all jokes, uh, but they know that it's very serious that I do have favorites among committees, and my favorite is judiciary. Um, Senator Paul uh, also has a competing hearing uh, in, in the Foreign Relations Committee. He wanted to be here today to introduce Justin Walker from him, his home state of Kentucky. I agreed to deliver that for him uh, today. He says, I regret that I'm not able to introduce Justin Walker in person, as I must be in another committee hearing. I am confident that Justin will be a tireless defender of the Constitution and an impartial jurist who treats all who come before him with the respect they deserve. I fully support his confirmation. I want to echo the words of, of Senator Paul and, uh, uh, and, and what I imagine to have been the words of Senator McConnell, who was here earlier. I've known Justin Walker for four or five years. I've found him to be an absolutely outstanding attorney, uh, 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 a true lawyer's lawyer. Uh, lawyers like Justin Walker can't be found many places, and whenever one can find a lawyer like Justin Walker who's willing to serve on the federal judiciary, I think we should all count ourselves lucky for that moment. Uh, I, I can tell you with a high degree of confidence, both as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee for the last eight and a half years and uh, a, a, as a lawyer for the last two decades, um, there are judges who come from different backgrounds. Uh, some people come to the federal district court as a judge with a lot of trial experience or with a lot of fact gathering uh, experience, experience uh, doing a lot of depositions or a lot of uh, witness uh, cross-examinations in the courtroom. Others come with a lot of writing experience. Now, while the former might seem more obvious as a qualifier, the latter is every bit as important and in many ways more rare. So when we have someone like Justin Walker, who's a law professor, who's written countless articles, who's written dispositive motions, appellate briefs, we have someone who will come to the federal district court well prepared to deal with what is in many ways the most difficult part of a job, which is addressing dispositive motions. Motions to dismiss, for example, under Rule 12b-6. Uh, motions for summary judgment under Rule 56. Uh, these are very difficult things to learn. They can't simply be taught. They're very difficult to acquire while on the job. I'm confident that Justin Walker is more than up to the task in that regard. Um, uh, Mr. Canterbury, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. In 2013, after the Sandy Hook shooting, you wrote a piece titled the responsibility of leadership in the Fraternal Order of Police Journal. In the piece, you stated that the FOP has a standing resolution, uh, one that was passed um, at the 1993 National Conference to support the assault weapons ban that was passed by Congress in 1994. Are you now personally supportive of an assault weapons ban? Sir, at our last national conference, the delegates overturned uh, that standing rule uh, and as an advocate for the FOP, it's been my position that I support what the members voted on uh, by a motion. So as so, ATF director, looking through a, a different set of lens, I would uh, much prefer to talk with the expert witnesses at ATF and the other professional staff uh, be before I would render an opinion uh, on the ban. So it's, uh, as a law enforcement professional, my job would be to enforce the laws that, that I, I Congress understood. Implements. Understood. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying uh, your position is consistent with and materially indistinguishable from that of the FOP. As FOP president, Senator, it's my job to, to be the, the spokesperson for the resolutions and motions passed by uh, my uh, elected body. So prior to the time that the FOP removed its support for that, you were supportive? Uh, I, I, the FOP was supportive, yes, sir, Mr. Senator. And, and you were personally being... Uh, a member and president of SO, F, FOP prior to that position change? Uh, yes. Sir. Uh, do you support limitations on magazine size? Uh, again, Senator, uh, the FOP's position is that we don't support any uh, legislation uh, as far as restriction on firearms at this point. As, as a uh, ATF nominee, uh, I believe it's 
my responsibility uh, to enforce the laws that are passed by Congress, and I would make sure that every agent working for me would understand that. Do you support universal background checks? The best information that we can have in the NICS system uh, is great, uh, but as far as the legislation of universal background checks, I would have to look at the uh, exact language um, to, to have a, a firm opinion on that, but I do believe that, that state and local uh, agencies should be encouraged to uh, get quick, concise, and accurate information into the NICS system. Do you still support waiting periods for handgun, handgun background checks, in, including in cases where the purchaser already owns a firearm? That was a national FOP position uh, back in the early 90s. Uh, we support the system uh, that's in place with the instant check, uh, with NICS uh, as an organization. Uh, and as Senator Feinstein said, there's been a number of people uh, who attempted to purchase firearms that, that NICS prevented. Mr. Chairman, I just noticed my time has expired. Can I, can I ask uh, one more question? So help me understand, are, are, are you telling me you have no positions independent of the FOP relative to firearms? And if so, how are we as a committee to evaluate where you stand on questions of policy? I understand and appreciate the, the fact that you respect the fact that if you're confirmed to this position, you'll be expected to follow the law and that you'll do so. I, I, I assume you can understand why we, we would still be interested in knowing where you come from on questions of policy, given the enormous discretion that someone in the position of uh, ATF director has. You're talking about promulgating regulations, making changes to them from time to time, regulations that have profound impacts that essentially change the law. Are you telling me that you have no positions that are analytically distinct from those of the FOP? Uh, Senator, I would have my, my own personal opinions based on my, my experience, uh, but I also believe as the head of a law enforcement this. agency, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, I believe that I would work with the staff uh, at ATF and the, the professionals at ATF and, and through the Department of Justice. Uh, the policy decisions uh, uh, require a, a process within the Department of Justice and I would follow those rules for those policy decisions. And as the ATF director, uh, my positions that I held at, AT, at the Fraternal Order of Police were the uh, positions of the Fraternal Order of Police. That, that was my responsibility. But uh, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. Uh, I believe in the right to bear arms. Uh, and I would work with uh, this committee uh, on any proposed changes in litigation. But I would want to see uh, those changes and have the expertise of of the career staff at ATF to make those decisions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got additional questions, but uh, we'll have to save those for a second round.